Hello, my friends, and welcome back to another Digital Fireside. My name is Mark Williams. I'm your host, and it's so good to be back with you for another wonderful Sunday Fireside. Thank you for spending your evening with us. We've got some fantastic speakers I'll introduce in just a few minutes. But before we get to that, if you haven't yet, go to turtle.link slash app and download the Our Turtle House app. It's totally free to check out, and there's some wonderful resources from some of your favorite Latter-day Saint speakers like John By the Way, Hank Smith, Meg Johnson, Carmen Herbert, and so many more. So go check that out at turtle.link slash app. And we also love hearing your feedback on these firesides. We want to hear your ideas for future topics and speakers so that we can make sure that the content that we create, these firesides included, are relevant to you and the situations you're going through. So if you have an idea that you want to share with us, leave that idea, those ideas for us at turtle.link slash share. With that, tonight's fireside is... Tonight's fireside is all about what to do when your loved ones are struggling and, and they might even leave the church or they've got faith questions and they're trying to, to navigate and move through that. How do we support them and what do we do if they actually choose to leave? We've got a few speakers tonight that are going to share their testimonies and their thoughts and perspectives, and I'm so excited to, to learn from them and their experience. Our first speaker tonight our first speaker tonight is best known for her genuine nature as a keynote speaker, author, and friend. As a professional speaker and trainer, she empowers parents and educators to thrive in their own mental and emotional health so they can be the example their youth need. She published her book, I See You, How Compassion and Connection Can Save Lives, back in 2020. She also published a children's book about self-acceptance entitled Broccoli Punzel, and she's recorded over 100 episodes on her podcast, I See You which has given hope and inspiration to thousands of listeners. She lives in Utah with her husband, Rob, their two children, and a little dog named Kobe. Let's welcome our good friend, Julie Lee. Julie, so good to have you back with us. Hi, I'm happy to be here. I'm excited to be here. This is, this is going to be awesome. So thank you so much for joining with us. Our other speaker for the evening is a faith-based life coach and the author of several books, including 21 Days to Success Through Networking, 21 Days to Success with LinkedIn, Marriage Advice to My Daughter, and the less than helpful grammar book, Irregardless. He's especially proud of his short book, The Chocolate Cake Phenomenon, which proves that chocolate cake is, in fact, spiritual. And he's also the host of a Latter-day Saint-themed podcast called Chocolate Cake Bikes and Untoxic Positivity, where he teaches about improving relationships with your in-laws. Let's welcome Ken Williams. Ken, so good to have you back, my brother. <laughs> Are we going to say what I said? What's that? Are we going to say what I said? Are we? Gonna well, I mean, we could. We might as we might as well. We yeah, we were talking a little bit beforehand, and Julie. Julie's like, wait a second. Are you, is this a family reunion? Are you guys related? No, and... I said, is that your dad? <laughs> <laughs> oh. We actually talked about getting a t-shirt that, uh, that would say he's my brother, not my son. And he's my brother, yes. not my dad. <laughs> we never did it. <laughs> we never did. Maybe, maybe we'll have to talk to Cindy and get, uh, and get one of those those shirts made or something like that. No, but this is going to be awesome. I'm so excited to talk with you guys about what to do when when loved ones leave the church or have faith questions and and come to have different beliefs than you may have. And so this is an important, it really is an important, not just question, but an important conversation because I know a lot of people personally that are going through this type of, these types of experiences. And so I'm interested to hear your thoughts and and advice and feedback in tonight's fireside. So let's start off with an opening prayer by Ken, and then we can get to hear from our first speaker, Julie. Our Father in heaven, we're grateful for the opportunity that we have of gathering together tonight virtually to discuss how we can handle when our loved ones leave. We're grateful for the opportunity that we have of taking advantage of this technology, and we're grateful for the uh, ideas that we will be able to share. May I say to bless us with thy spirit, that we can be prompted and guided on how we can interact with those loved ones in our lives that uh, may be uh, exploring or struggling or having their own faith challenges. And we ask you to bless us with uh, thy guidance and inspiration. And these things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ken. Now, Julie, you have 
an awesome podcast. I, I see you, you've had, had well over a hundred episodes and, and your book as well. What was it that, that made you originally want to start a podcast like that? Oh yeah. I mean, it's a pretty clear, am- I don't always have good answers for things, but the answer <laughs> is clear on that one. Uh, yeah. So my mental health completely fell apart when I was 21. I was in a work situation under uh, some really tough leadership, uh, pretty toxic work culture environment. And for the next five, that's kind of the catalyst that started it. But the, for the next five and a half, six years, I was on and off meds, in and out of therapy, just trying to run away from this susceptibility I seemed to have towards anxiety and depression, which was just so outlandish for me as just what what I understood of that uh, as just the driven, happy, outgoing girl I've always been. Um, and it was really the compassion and and people intentionally connecting with me during that time that truly saved my life. And and changed it, changed the trajectory of it. So now I'm, now I go and speak and train on it to to companies and to faculties, and I love it. Talk about how to see your employees and and help work culture be a place that people want to stay and 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 impact positive mental health in the workplace. Which since COVID, you see, you asked the wrong question. I'm just going now. I'm like, well, let me. <laughs> since, since COVID, there's been a lot of research um, in the way that people's mental health has been impacted at work. Totally. So, really special thing I do. Yeah. And I, I like love that. When I get the chance too. So this is good. This is good. I love it. Well, this is, it's an honor to have you and I'm so excited to learn from you. I love the work that you're doing and, and go, ahead, go ahead and take it away, my friend. Okay. Sounds like a plan. I'm happy to be here. Um, this is an interesting topic that has been given. And if I seem a little tired, it's because I am. I've been up with sick people all night. Uh, but even though I'm tired... <laughs> This topic is so dear to my heart uh, when loved ones leave because of my own experiences. And so I'm excited to share just just a few things I've learned as as we all share together in this this evolving life that we all have. And and certainly the the ideas and the thoughts that I have today are probably different than the ones that I had um, 10 years ago, five years ago, probably even just a year ago. And so I hope as we talk, I myself know I need self-compassion. and, and I hope that you, as you're listening, extend the same self-compassion to yourself. I love the quote by Maya Angelou. She says, when you when you know better, you do better. Uh, and there's things that I've not always done well and how to handle when loved ones leave the church. And there's things that I've learned to do really well. So I still remember the day that I received a text message uh, from one of my parents that they were taking their name off the records of the, of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And uh, they were so dedicated to the church from my understanding and my upbringing that I remember saying to, to a sibling, I would have been more, I would have been less shocked had they like killed someone. Like it, it was, it was so shocking to me when it happened. I really didn't see it coming. And I literally threw my phone. Um, I had my phone. And I, I have my phone right now and I had this text message and I saw it and I, and I just, I just, I don't know what happened, but viscerally it was so shocking to me and I chucked my phone across the room. So that's where I'm coming from. <laughs> that was my first experience with having a really dear loved one leave the church. Um, pretty shocking and, and altering as far as the way I viewed the way I was brought up and the way my testimony was lit. Um, and I have compassion for that girl that, that checked the phone, right? I have compassion for her and the shock and the pain that comes from having someone uh, that leads you a certain way in your upbringing, have them shift and, and no longer believe it or, or believe in deity of every, of any kind. Uh, I since have had some, some other close people, many close people to me leave the church, including a sibling. And I, I've had a lot of thoughts and a lot of experience and a lot of thing, times doing things well and times when I didn't do things well. And so I come to this conversation very humbly <laughs> and just grateful that this is a learning process for all of us. Um, having these experiences, having people leave, there's really been three things for me that I found through the spirit and through through trying again and again to do things the way that I believe my savior would want me to, uh, that have been really helpful for me that I want to touch on before I, well, and I'll, I'll list them. One is love and gentleness. 
uh, owning my own testimony and boundaries as needed. And so I, I just listed those real quick on the paper and I was like, hey, there's an acronym there, LOB. <laughs> I also love a good acronym as a speaker. So I'm like, okay, this is what we LOB when, when we have a loved one leave the church that's so special to us. Love and gentleness, owning my own testimony and boundaries as needed. Before I, I break those down a little bit and why I found them so helpful, I also want to acknowledge that I come to this conversation having had my own struggles and doubts and taking a lot of really close looks at what I believe, a lot of questioning. You know, we're all given different spiritual gifts in life, and I absolutely have my own spiritual gifts that I've been able to find as I because I have different life experiences and I'm, and I'm given the opportunity to impact others. Uh, and I have a gift of faith. I am promised that my patriarchal blessing and I hold that dear to me. I will say that I am, I am a mega questioner naturally. I think um, I like to study things out and I know that that's a blessing as my testimony, uh, as my testimony grows, I, I naturally do need to know things for myself. And I also have times when I'm able to lean on others, but I guess I acknowledge that first uh, because I, I can say that I absolutely believe the church is true. And there are certain doctrines that I feel like I have an almost sure knowledge of because of some spiritual experiences I've had. And having said that, there, there are ones that, that I believe and that I lean on my own faith and sometimes the faith of others, because I don't totally understand. And the questions are always there and I'm always working to understand better. And, and it's a really happy place for me to be. I'm really happy here. I wasn't always happy to be there, to have so many questions and to not believe quite so quickly and readily as, as some of my peers that I really look up to. Uh, but I found that to be a strength in my own life. So so as I have this discussion, I just want to acknowledge that first, that I um, that I am on a journey always with, with these conversations. And in that way, the, the having people that I love that are close to me leave the church has been has been part of that journey and a strengthening part in some ways and, and, and an uh, opportunity to look really closely at what I believe. So having said that, let's get back to lob and a lobbying thing. So when someone leaves the church, that sounds terrible. Don't tell your friends I said that. You know what I mean. Love and gentleness. I think that first one, L, love and gentleness. I think it can be really easy. I know for myself that when someone, someone goes back on something they've believed, and especially when it's a shared belief with you, um, I think it can be really, really tempting to get very defensive. I know I've certainly been there and it can feel very personal, strangely. Um, when someone else rejects or says, I no longer believe something that is so sacred, important to you, it can feel like a personal attack on you. And I think it's so important in these times to do our best to remember the Savior's example and to to love one another. Um, and that's not dependent on people's choices, uh, upon their beliefs. And to come at the conversation with love and gentleness when people are, are most people that I've met that have had questions within the church, including myself and, and those that have, have actually left the church, most of them that I know personally, there's been a lot of struggle and pain involved in that decision. While it's easy and, and maybe more simple to think that all oh, people just, they just don't want to be a part of it because it doesn't fit their lifestyle or it doesn't, I, I don't think that's always the case. Well, I don't even want to say I don't think, I know that is not always the case is very often my closest people to me that have left, it's, it's been quite a struggle and it's been a lot of thought put into it. And, and sometimes the point when they're leaving, they, they've already had years often of confusion and struggle. And so I have found that coming at that situation with love and gentleness is so key because, because they're opening up to me sometimes for the first time about something that's been an internal battle. It's usually not something they thought of that day, right? And so coming at the situation with love and gentleness and trying to not take their decision personally, I found that really important. Second for, oh, owning my own testimony. Um, obviously, this is really personal to me as I had a parent leave uh, who, who believed very in a very traditional, structured, orthodox way uh, in the teachings of the Church of Jesus Christ, Christ of Latter-day Saints and, and implemented that in my home. Um, it became so, I always knew it was important to have my own testimony, but it became especially 
profound and absolutely necessary that I decide what I believed in. And to be honest, having a, a parent that really foundationally set the tone and 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 was the catalyst for a lot of the fire burning in me because I'm a really passionate person in in most areas of my life and most certainly the way I feel about the gospel and especially about the savior. Um, and I believe some of that passion came from that person. Um, they're deeply passionate as well. And so it became really important for almost for me to allow parts of my testimony to kind of fall apart for a little bit as I, as I tried to decide what did it all mean? What did it all mean that I was taught this way and I felt the spirit this way with this person and now they're saying it wasn't that and, and they're confused and, and or what does that mean for me in building my own testimony? taking complete responsibility of my own testimony. I heard it all the time as a youth growing up. Uh, I knew it. I knew I needed to have my own testimony, uh, but it became super real for me when I did have a parent leave the church. And so owning my own testimony, putting in the work to decide what have my personal experiences with the spirit been? Uh, what have my, what have my life experiences taught me? Where have I found peace and joy? What are the patterns that I notice in my life? Some of this, uh, my sister gave me this idea she'd heard it in a talk once at church where someone had a, a book of, and then their name. So for me, it would be a book of Julie where they, where they recorded all the times they felt the spirit in their life, where they had these spiritual interactions. And so I did that for a while as I was trying to understand what my testimony was now. Um, I went through my journals and I, as I tried to own my own testimony, I went through, you know, when I was 14 and I was at youth conference and I had this, this burning feeling and I didn't know what it meant. And I tried to use these, these weak English words to describe it. I went and I, I copied that and I made, I started to make a book of Julie to try to understand the patterns in my life and to see what I really believed on my own. So owning your own testimony, really important for me as I've had loved ones leave. And the third is boundaries as needed. I say that because I have found that boundaries are the best things for my relationships. Um, boundaries, we put boundaries in place to keep relationships good, not to um, hurt them. And I say this because I do think when someone leaves the church, it's not uncommon. It's not the situation for everyone, certainly, but it's not uncommon to have feelings of wanting to express all the turmoil they've been on. Sometimes there's anger at the church. Sometimes there's feelings of betrayal and wanting safe places to express that, which makes a lot of sense. I know in my own life, when I felt a shift in what I think, or I feel like I've learned something that changes the way I think about something, there is a hunger to feel understood. And with that, as, as someone, especially if it's a really close loved one and, it, and it, maybe it even shakes your own testimony a little bit, I think it's so important to to set up boundaries of what you feel you can talk about and things you can't. I always think uh, love is the best policy. I've had times in my life when I've, when I've had to say, Hey, I don't, I don't feel comfortable talking about that. Or um, can we talk about it in this way? And, and, and there's, I think when there's a common love there, there's, there can be a common respect there. And I'm so grateful. I found that in my own relationships. I found ways to navigate that when I felt that, conversations weren't helpful. Um, and they were, they no longer felt as a way to express understanding, but they, they started to turn into something else that wasn't good for our relationship. So boundaries is needed. So that's how I lob <laughs> when, when I have loved ones that leave the church. Um, I always think about the, the experience of when a woman is caught in adultery and then by no means am I trying to compare adultery with leaving the church but this pattern, not, but, and this pattern that Jesus taught us of when, when someone chooses something that we believe is not what we want to choose. Uh, but when, when Christ says, you know, why are you casting stones? Who's who here doesn't have any sin, doesn't have any mistake, doesn't have any, like why you go ahead, you cast the first stone. And of course everyone leaves because no one has that. And I think that it can be easy without realizing it to cast stones at people who leave the church. Um, whether that's via, via good intentions, but, but Hey, I'm going to throw a conference talk at you. That's going to change your mind. Hey, I'm going to throw a scripture at you. That's going to change your mind. Certainly there are times and places for missionary work. 
I think often when someone makes the decision to leave the church, more than that, even they need to know that they are loved no matter what, first and foremost. If there is ever a point when someone's going to change their mind and decide that they do want to be a part of the church again, I don't know how they're going to do that. Um, if they don't know that there's love waiting for them there, if they don't have that space to come back um, and to be loved irregardless. And so I think number one, always when someone leaves the church is to make sure that we are following the example of our savior that way. I think about how the Grinch stole Christmas and I think about how Cindy Lou who came and she, she came to the Grinch. Once again, I'm doing all these terrible comparisons, but the, I love the analogies of them. But I, once again, I'm not calling our loved ones that leave the church green and hairy, which if you have a loved one that leaves the church that is green and hairy, that is super cool. I would love to see a picture, but, um, but when the Grinch, Cindy Lou who comes uh, in the Jim Carrey version of the video, she comes and she invites him to come to him. She's kind to him. She has compassion for him. Now, when, when he was down in Whoville as a kid, we get more of this background in the Jim Carrey version. The people were not kind to him. They made fun of him. They were cruel to him. He didn't have a good experience with Whoville. And I think we all know people who haven't, who've had some pretty negative experiences in the church and, and have had feelings hurt and, and I would even say rightly so at times. I've had my feelings hurt by experiences I've had within the church, right? Does that make Jesus wrong? Does that make his teachings wrong? No, but there's still there's still an association there that, that the brain puts on. And so what's really powerful in the Grinch is how as an adult, Cindy Lou who comes as someone, a who from Whoville, and she shows him love and kindness and compassion. Then at the end of the movie, I hope you all watch The Grinch to prepare for this talk. <laughs> I always find a way to bring in The Grinch, I feel like, into gospel things. At the end of the movie, he's going to tip all this Christmas stuff he's stolen from Christmas. And he hears something. He hears singing down from Whoville. And I very confidently say, I don't know if I believe he would have been able to hear the music and the beautiful singing from Whoville if he had not first been touched by Cindy Lou Who, if he had not been reminded that there are people down here that are kind and that love you, would he have been able to even hear and understand that they were singing if he hadn't had that touch? And that's how I feel when people leave the church. If they don't have that feeling of love and understanding, how hard is it going to be able to, for them to be able to recognize this church and this gospel, this ever evolving, um, restoration of gospel truth from Christ himself, how are they going to be able to recognize the spirit and the music and the community and the unity and the, the unadulterated, completely compassionate love that comes from living the teachings of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think about especially post couple years, post COVID uh, and the divisiveness, I think we all saw with, with COVID, this can be an opportunity for us to be counterculture against divisiveness instead of looking for ways that, that make us different. What are the ways that make us alike? You think about the pioneers. I live here in Utah and uh, we have a really strong pioneer heritage of, as members of the church, we all do, right? But but the pioneers came here and they settled here. And I read their stories and I think about how did they get through it? How did the pioneers bury children and spouses on the side of the road? How did they get through it? The answer is they got through it together. They did it together. They made these sacrifices as saints together. They were burying babies on the side of the road together. They were pushing with bloody feet and no shoes together. The problem we can have is the isolation factor. As saints, when we're together, when we're united in a common cause, we can do anything. We're, we're unstoppable. And I think as someone that believes in an adversary and as in Satan, I believe his greatest tool now, and I even had a therapist share this with me, his greatest tool is isolation, pushing saints away from each other. And while um, we can, which brings up the interesting question of what does it mean to be a saint? We talk a lot about the church and the kingdom. And I mean, I'm going to steal something from Anthony Sweat, who I know has been on here many times. Um, he talks, he, he verbalizes really well feelings that, that interact with my soul in a really helpful way. He talks about the church being a vehicle for the covenants, a vehicle for us to covenant with, with God. And that's really, really important. 
um, as we want to access a relationship with God here on earth. It's certainly not the only way to access, but he has said there's special power that comes from keeping and making sacred covenants. There's also something called the kingdom. And the kingdom is not membership in the church. The kingdom is the entire earth. In fact, there's a, crypt, a scripture in Psalms that I have found so helpful. And as I think about the kingdom, it's Psalms uh, chapter 145, verses 12 through 15. And this is what it says. To make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. And as we're thinking about the kingdom being the whole earth, the kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. The Lord upholdeth that fall and raiseth up all those that be bowed down. The kingdom is the entire earth. It is all people. And as we covenant to build the kingdom of God, we are building people. We are building each other. We are building a community of love and kindness. And so that's why I feel so strongly about this meaningful conversation and in balancing when someone leaves the church, the L, the love and the gentleness and the compassion that people so deeply need to not divide from us as people, because we are all the kingdom members of the church or not. And also the, the um, care we have about the O and the B, which is owning your own testimony and, and having boundaries as needed. Uh, lobbying has become so important to me as I have people I deeply love and care about and feel such sacred um, just grace for in their journeys out of the church. And I know that the united cause we can all have, something we can all agree on in a time when it is easy to divide and it's easy to find ways to, to without even meaning to, to isolate from each other inside and outside the church. For us to choose to be counterculture sometimes and to say, no, 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 no. That's not the kingdom of God that I know that I love and believe. That is a cause that I think we can all believe in and unite on. And I leave my testimony with you just that I have found that I think a principle of the gospel that I can't even scratch the surface on because of the experiences I've had that I know is more powerful than I can understand is the love of God for his people, regardless of their behavior, just the pure love of Jesus Christ and the way that that um, can transcend all differences. And the, the example that that's been in my life and the kind of human I, I strive to be and I fail and I continue to strive, that love of the Savior is and his atonement is something that is more powerful than anything that can divide us. And I am grateful to be in this church that I so deeply believe is true. And I continue to try to understand and ask questions. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen, Julie. I love you. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> I love that message. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. No, I love that message. And just we we need to lob more. I love that uh, that acronym. But there was a quote that you you shared that I thought was so insightful that if somebody leaves the church and we hope that they come back someday, if we're not expressing and showing them that there's love for them within the church, then how are they ever supposed to come back? Mm -hmm. And, uh, the, you know, you use the example of the Grinch. And another story that came to mind is, is I remember growing up, my dad often would say, if you ever come and tell me about something that you did wrong. I, I'll never discipline you. I'll, there might be natural consequences of your choices, but I will never be the one to punish you. And, and it made it a really safe space to come and talk about the problems that you're, you're dealing with. And I remember talking with him about that later. And he says, if, if I punished you for coming and telling me the truth, then how would that create a situation where you'd ever want to tell me the truth again? If you know yep. that you're going to come and get punished. And I, I loved how you brought that up in terms of the church, that if, if people don't feel that they're loved or that they're the love that we have for them is conditional on whether or not we agree with their choices, then what incentive do they have to be around us? You know, and we're asking for the same in return, right? We're asking, do you still love me? Because you <clears throat> agree with what I do. I mean, isn't that what right. we're both? Oh, doing? totally. Yeah, definitely. 
Can I share one last thing? I know my Please, time. Please, yeah. Is no, 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 that'd be great. Want- I'd I love just, that. this is like a real, a real time moment, right? This is when the fun stuff happens. And exactly. To a friend right before this, as I was thinking about a billion thoughts I could share of, of all the ideas in my head. Uh, and I was thinking about, anyways, they just texted me this quote, like literally as I was speaking and I glanced at it for a second. I was like, <laughs> That's awesome. time to I'm like, hang on. <laughs> well, but I just want to read it because I just glanced at it for a minute when you were speaking. I just glanced down and saw a couple phrases that I was like, I just want to share this real quick. Yeah because maybe it's hopeful to someone and there's a reason this quote came in. So it's by Dallin H. Oaks. He says, the gospel has many teachings about keeping the commandments while living among people with different beliefs and practices. The teachings about contention are central. Oh, and I could cry about this. Just thinking about President Nelson's talk on contention that was so incredible. So good. About the teachings about contention are central. When the resurrected Christ found the Nephites disputing over the manner of baptism, He gave clear directions on how this ordinance should be performed. Then he taught this great principle. There shall be no disputations among you as there hitherto have been. Neither shall there be disputations among you concerning the points of my doctrine as there have hitherto been. For verily, verily, I say unto you, he that hath the spirit of contention is not of me, but is of the devil, who is the father of contention, and he stirreth up the hearts of men to contend with anger one with another. And that goes back to that point of, the pioneers did it because they did it together. They were in one cause. The devil inside, outside of the church, I believe he knows right now in our time, he is killing people literally by trying to get us to be isolated from each other because mm. we believe differently, because we think differently. And I just think that that is, that is the second the spirit leaves is when the contention comes. And I, I believe that's what he's saying. That's when Christ came in, in his body form to America so quickly that was like the first thing he did is he said you're off this is all the contention <laughs> like you're off i'm right. going to teach you very simply how we do yep. this contention is not of me arguing over the way you're baptized like let me set this straight that's that's not what this gospel is about you're way off the mark and i think man that feels powerful to me today oh totally that that was amazing thank you so much for sharing that and i love i love that also the um that quote that you wrapped up with fantastic and also i love the idea of the book of julie mm-hmm. just having uh, a way to discover the patterns of how god interacts with you and that i can i can see that that would be um really valuable i learned there were times that i learned about how the spirit spoke to me years later as i was sharing experiences and I discovered (laughs) that was the spirit. So having that document is fantastic. And I love the idea that you brought up that um, boundaries can be the best thing for relationships. And I discovered that in a really interesting way (laughs) at at work, as I was um, having very direct, very straightforward, very clear cut and not uh, really soft and fluffy conversations with employees. I did this three times. In fact, I, I t- fired a guy a couple of days ago because he was not doing the things that he should be doing. And in all three of those cases, uh, individuals came back with um, just a deeper um, kindness or respect. I had one person who said, you're, you're kind of like a father figure. Uh, so I want to get your opinion on this. And the guy that I fired two days ago sent me a text yesterday. Hey, I, I just want to let you know how much I appreciate every, everything you've done for me. And so those boundaries, they can be really uncomfortable mm-hmm. as you're establishing and, and enforcing them, but it really can be a, a great thing for a relationship because then you make a really safe space. You know that we can discuss this. This is off limits. I'm not quite ready to get there. And it really can, can uh, create a robust relationship. I love that. Well, and it's honesty, right? Like if, if, if I don't have trust in my relationship that we can actually talk about what's going on, I don't feel comfortable asking you for help. I don't feel right. Like I just like, and, and you to have those honest conversations. I mean, for me as an employee, I'd know you'll tell me if there's a problem, I don't have to second guess. Mm-hmm. And then I know that you as a boss, sorry, now I'm like going into my secular. <laughs> speaking, but then I know that you as a boss also, when you tell me I did a good job, you mean it, you know? Yeah. So I just, I love that, that trust. There's a whole other soapbox about our relationship with God and Christ with all that too. So um, 
I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it, Julie. That was so good. So powerful. Thank you so much for sharing your testimony and your perspective on how we can navigate life when the, our loved ones leave the church. Thank you. That was great. We'll move to our final speaker of the evening. My brother from the same mother. <laughs> As you were talking about that, I was thinking, man, I wish I had that dad. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? So no, he was he was very much like that. Yeah, yeah. You know, he was he was great in that that sense. But so good to have you here on the fireside. It's always good to have you here on the fireside. And I'm excited to hear your perspective on how we can navigate life when our loved ones leave the church or have different beliefs than we do. All right. So here's I just want to set the set the stage a little bit, kind of um explain the context of where I'm coming from. Um as Mark mentioned, Mark and I are brothers. I'm the oldest, he's the youngest. Uh, there are six of us. All of us are still active in the church. Parents are still, um, they're the, the card-carrying members of the church. And uh, we're all married in the temple. And uh, I have five kids and things were looking like that pattern was going to continue. And then when my uh, second son, my second son, my second kid, <laughs> who is my second kid, but my first son, um, was about 18 years old. He was actually preparing for his mission and working on getting his papers together. And we started to see kind of a shift that things weren't quite the way that they had been. And he had had some of those experiences like Julia talked about, things that he would have written in his book of Brendan. And um, we had some phenomenal conversations. And there was a day he had moved out of the house and, and wasn't really connecting with us uh, as a family. And there was a day that I needed to get some information from him. And so he came over and in addition to what I had asked for, he threw on my lap a letter that said that um, because of your request, we have decided to, or we have agreed to um, remove your name from the church records. And there was no comment, no um, explanation. It was just, he literally threw it in my lap. And I read this and I was, um, I gave it to my wife. And so that's, that's the context. So he formally left the church and, um, there was a little bit, a lot of <laughs> tension between us. So that's, that's where I'm coming from. I was at the time on the high council. I went to the stake president and said, Hey, I just want to let you know what's going on in my life. And, um, I, I this was new to me. I didn't know how to navigate it. And so, um, there are some things that I've learned over the, the years. This is several years now. And so I want to share some, some things that happened in my journey and some of them may not seem well connected, but they come together. <laughs> I promise. I promise about 15 years ago, I was, um, working full time. I was in a master's program. I was, um, the state young men's president. My wife had just been called to be the Ward Relief Society president. And just because I had nothing else to do, I decided to get my pilot's license. So just a couple blocks from our house is a small airport, and I would go down there and, and uh, get my license. Things were uh, a lot crazy. And getting my license, that was tough. Uh, I've driven a car for a lot of years and, and it's automatic for me now and getting my license. I remember the, the first day first, you, you could, I guess, call it a lesson. I'm hopping in the plane with Jim. He's talking me through the checklist and, uh, in a plane, in a small Cessna, you steer with your feet. And so if you want to turn right, you push the right, um, rudder pedal, which turns the nose wheel. If you want to turn left, because this with the control, you doesn't do anything when you're on the ground, you don't have the, the airflow. And so as we're going, we're just kind of all over the place. And I'm the one who's controlling the plane. And Jim is telling me, stay on the yellow line. There's a yellow line that gets us from the ramp where we were out to the runway. And I'm trying to, my feet are just, I just, I'm not unathletic, but my brain was not coordinating with my feet the way that I imagined that they were supposed to. I finally got through that. We got up in the air. We had some, some great fun. And um, as my training progressed, it was important for me to learn how to be the person who was actually taking off and landing. Um, flying itself is pretty simple. If you want to go up, you pull back. If you want to go down, you push forward. If you want to go right, you turn right. 
left, turn left. And the taking off part and the landing part, that's critical because if you don't do it well, that's the last time. And I remember over and over and over again, it was just hard. I was not getting it. It was, it was uncomfortable. So let me put that, that story aside. We'll come back to it. I was, um, back when I was on the high council, I was sitting, um, in a, what is now called a membership. I think it's called a membership council. This is back in those days, we called them disciplinary councils. This is when, if somebody had done something serious enough that the church needed to take some kind of action, then there would be a, uh, a council convened and it would be depending on the circumstance. It could be at the bishopric level. It could be the, at the stake level, which would include the high council and the stake presidency. And I was sitting on, in on one, one of those. And the individual had made some serious decisions that uh, had the potential of affecting his membership in the church. And I remember the discussion that I learned or that I that I heard from the stake president after we had had all of the discussions, after we had the, the um, I think the individual was there and discussed what had happened and the different versions of events and spouse was involved in, in having some of those those discussions as well. And the stake president, after listening to the discussion from the high counselors and then going back and counseling with his presidency and praying, came back and, and the decision was made that this person was going to lose his membership in the church. And he said something that was super interesting. He said, it is clear that you are not able to keep your covenants. And Julie talked about covenants. And I love that idea. The church is the vehicle for covenants. And the stake president told this individual, it is clear that you're not able to keep your covenants because of just where the person was mm -hmm. at the time. And the stake president explained, and I never heard of it explained this way. He said, the kindest thing we can do is remove them. I had no idea that it would be kind to remove covenants. So back to when Brennan threw us that letter and said, I've decided to, to remove my name from the church records. One of the first thoughts that came to my mind was that experience. The kindest thing we can do is remove the covenants. Brennan had decided to make some, some choices that were not consistent with the covenants that he had made. The covenants, the path of um, the covenant path that we talk about in the church we have baptism, we have priesthood ordination, we have uh, the endowment, we have the, the sealing ordinances, and then we have enduring to the end or, or keeping the covenants. He had made some decisions that wasn't consistent with those covenants. And it was very comforting to me to have that thought, the kindest thing we can do is remove those covenants. And that reminded me, or I was reminded of that also I was, um, I'm a temple ordinance worker and I was working at the temple one Friday evening and I had an experience where I read a scripture and I was looking for it. I couldn't find it um, <laughs> this afternoon as I was trying to put uh, my final thoughts together. And, and the scripture had to do with how you're going to be more harshly judged. This was a group of, of former believers. You're going to be more harshly judged than this group of non-believers because you know the truth. And my first thought was, well, how does that, how, how does that impact Brendan? How does that affect uh, other friends, family members, people that I know that have decided to take a different path? And as I pondered that, I realized that's the wrong question to ask. The right question to ask is, what does that mean for me? Where am I on this, this path? Uh, several years ago, uh, President Irene, gave a talk in general conference. Mark, go ahead and throw out that first slide. He said, if you're worried about what the family relationship is going to be in the afterlife, if you're worried about, are there going to be empty chairs? And this is not exactly how he said it, but if, are there going to be empty chairs? Um, are, am I going to be sad in this exalted state because my family won't be there? He said, if you're worried about that, you're worried about the wrong problem. Get yourself there. You just live worthy of the celestial kingdom and the family relationships 
will be more wonderful than you can imagine. How comforting is that? For me, that was immensely comforting. So a little bit more about Brendan's story. Brendan was, um, is super great <clears throat> at math. He would be the math tutor for our kids. <laughs> and so there were, there were times that he would uh, try to, to take a math problem, turn it into a, a, an object lesson. And there was one time he was talking to his sister. I think it was Carissa. And he was explaining, he, he just grabbed uh, an object to make the point uh, that he was trying to make in this math problem. And the object that he grabbed was a lemon. And he held it up and he said, okay, this, this is $20. This represent, represents $20. So in our family now, a lemon is $20. Well, several years ago, Carissa was serving a mission on Temple Square. And Temple Square missionaries are absolutely wonderful. And the great thing about Temple Square missionaries is because they're in the, the public all the time, they have a, um, an opportunity to have people come and visit. And so my in-laws got to go visit. I got to visit a couple of times as I went to, to uh, visit General Conference. And Brendan, as he was leaving home, uh, leaving Indianapolis area to go work in California was going to be passing through the Temple Square area. And he decided he wanted to visit his sister. And so he um, he decided that now you can prearrange to visit your uh, sweet sister missionaries or sometimes, as I sometimes have done, you can just show up. And I told Brendan, here's how you need to do it. If you want to prearrange, here's how you can connect with her and you can work it out that way. Or if you want to surprise her, you can do that. But keep in mind, there are about 150 sister missionaries on Temple Square. The chance that she's going to be in any given point, pretty small. And he said, I want to surprise her. So this is something that has become a thing in our family. We like to surprise people. And so Friday afternoon, Brennan texted me and he said, I'm stopping at the store. And I'm going to grab some lemons because lemons represent $20. He's going to give Carissa a bunch of lemons. And then I'm going to go see if I can surprise her. So flip to that, that next uh, slide. So he got a bunch of lemons. And I was wanting, as a father would want, I wanted him to just have an experience with his sister on Temple Square. And so I had this silent prayer that please Heavenly Father bless him to have the kind of experience that he needs. Now, at the time I was getting ready, I was going to be leaving within minutes to work my temple shift that Friday afternoon. So I was not going to be available to take phone calls. And I told Brendan, I want to hear how things go. So please call me. But just to understand, it's going to be several hours before I'll be, I'll be able to take a phone call. So I had my uh, phone in my locker at the temple and I'm passing by my locker and my smartwatch is buzzing with notifications and it's driving me crazy. And I get this picture on the right. Uh, I should tell you also that as I'm having this silent prayer, the, the um, moment that I'll put in my, that I have put in my book of kin is I know where my children are. Heavenly Father knows he knows where his children are. And so I get this picture and about 10 o'clock at night, I get the whole story that Brendan's on Temple Square. He's wanting to pass out these lemons just so we can uh, have them all be handed to, to Carissa. He ends up running into her. And at the same time, my sister, who was on Temple Square, and I had no idea, but she was on Temple Square with her family for spring break, was thinking, I wonder if there's a chance we could run into Carissa. And so Candace and her family and Carissa and Brendan all converge at the flagpole, which is where the tours start. What are the chances that that would happen? And I will tell you, the chance is zero. It doesn't happen. That just doesn't happen. And it happened. Heavenly Father knows where his children are. So I had an experience um, many, many years ago, I've been married 30, almost 33 years, uh, or about 33 years, uh, ish. <laughs> and so as, 
you, you might be shocked as I was to learn that there was a period of time and probably still is occasional periods of time where I was grating on my sweet wife's nerves. I was just irritating her with everything that I did. And she told me later that she was praying. She begged her father in heaven to fix me. Please, I can't deal with this guy anymore. Please fix him. And she told me the story. It was su such a humbling experience. And Julie talked about experiences that she's had where she's discovered the love that her father in heaven has for her. And I had, I've had some of those experiences as well. And the experience that Marcin has, has shared with me is that as she's pleading with her father in heaven to fix me so that I'm not such a jerk, the response that she feels in her heart is he's your husband, but he's my son. Heavenly father knows his children. Um, there's a story that I absolutely love. I'm going to tell it very briefly, but, uh, Sean Rapier, who's uh, a fantastic podcaster and he's done the, uh, Dur the turtle house firesides before he's on episode 19 of my chocolate cake bites podcast. And he tells this story, but he has a, a son who decided he wasn't really interested in the church and Sean was traveling. I think he was down in Tampa and pled with the Lord, please help me know what to do. And the answer that came to him as he told the story was, he's my son. He's my son. So what is our responsibility when a loved one leaves? And I think our responsibility is to love. Our responsibility is to love them. The question that I would ask is if someone leaves the church, or it could be anything else, if they, if they just, maybe they have different political beliefs. Maybe they voted for some different person than you did. Is that more important than the relationship? And I hope not. I hope that nobody's church membership or political affi affiliation or other ideology is more important than them as a person. So as a life coach, one of the things that I absolutely love to do is I love to ask questions. I love to ask questions that make people think. So I have some qu questions. I'm going to base them on some scriptures. Um, go ahead and throw the scriptures slide up. These are two scriptures. There are other scriptures. Um, but Moses 139. For behold, this is my work and my glory to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life, of, uh, eternal life of man. That's God speaking. His work, his glory is to make us immortal, which our understanding is to live forever. That's the resurrection. We get that. That's a free gift available to all of us through Christ and his atonement and eternal life. And that's exaltation. So think about that. The second scripture that I've got, Doctrine and Covenants 130 verse two, and that so, same sociality, which I have the definition down at the bottom. It's the social nature of tendencies is shown assembling the way that we interact with people. That same sociality, which exists among us here, will also exist among us there in the exalted state. Only it will be coupled with eternal glory, which glory we do not now enjoy. Now, scriptures you may be thinking of that I did not put up are the ones that, um, like in, um, I think it's Proverbs that says, teach a child the way he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. Or there's the one that says that uh, it's the responsibility of the parents to teach the children. Otherwise, the sins of the children are on the heads of the parents. I did not include those because a lot of times we weaponize those scriptures. We use those scriptures as evidence that we're not good enough. That if I just done one more family prayer, then maybe he wouldn't have left the church. If I just done one more family home evening, if we had just been a little bit better at family scripture study. And I'm here to tell you, I don't think that that's true. So move, move to the uh, the next screen there, the, the uh, next slide that's got some questions. These are some questions. I don't have all the answers, but a question that I have is for God's work and his glory, what percentage of the earth's total population from beginning to end would need to achieve exaltation for God to be successful? Would God set up a plan that is destined to succeed or would he set up a plan that's destined to fail? Would he set you up to succeed or would he set you up to fail? I believe in a loving Heavenly Father who wants his children to succeed. I don't believe he would intentionally set one of his children up to fail. I don't think he set Brendan up 
to fail, we'll just put that in air quotes, because by having me as his father or by the experience that we had, I don't think that he sets us up to fail. God is all powerful. He's all knowing. That's what I believe. So the question that I would ask myself is, can I, I am not anywhere close to perfect. Do I have the power to hijack or undermine or frustrate God's plan for Brendan? Do I have the power to pull people off of God's path? And sometimes we may think about stories like Alma the Younger, and we know that he led some people away from the church. But think about the experience that he had. And he describes that as exquisite was his pain throughout his repentance process, that was the joy that he felt as he repented and he returned to his, um, his association with God. What kind of plan would a perfect and loving God create to exalt his children? And let's go to that. I think it's the last slide there. As I was, um, I've got one more after this. So what if, go back to the earlier one. There you go. So what if you helped a struggling chicken to hatch? I did a little bit of research on this and you may not kill the chicken, but the purpose of a hatching chicken, trying to get through that egg gives it strength to help it, to help it succeed in life. What if you reduced your weight load while ex exercising? What if your life were smooth and easy? Going back to when I was learning to fly, all of those hard, hard experiences. And if you've learned to drive a um, manual transmission car, maybe you understand that type of experience as you're trying to hit the clutch and shift gears and all this. And, and when you thought you were coordinated, all of a sudden you're, you're not coordinated anymore. What if everything was easy? There would be no growth. What if someone's path to accept the Savior requires them to step off the path for a time? What if that experience makes them stronger? So Brendan, you saw the lemons. Brendan had taken those lemons and he wrote scriptures on there. And I thought, when I saw that, I thought, this is interesting to me <laughs> that there's, there's something still going on. Brendan has affiliated with a different church and Pastor Jody loves Brendan. Brendan is such a great help. Brendan just got... Um, the word he used was ordained as a chaplain in his church. He's teaching other people to have a connection with Christ. One of the things that um, <laughs> that he did, so I've got my chocolate cake, chocolate cake is spiritual. I tend to talk about chocolate cake and I have a great chocolate cake recipe, which is in the, <laughs> it's in the book. Brendan came to me one, one Sunday morning as I was making chocolate cake and he asked if he had a, if I had a copy of the book that he could borrow. And I said, yeah, do you want, are you looking for the recipe? And he said, no, I'm teaching Sunday school today in my church. And I want to talk about how you can minister with chocolate cake. Yeah. So, so I gave him a copy of the book and he has ministered to his congregation with chocolate cake. He's taught people how to develop a better relationship with Christ, with their savior, with chocolate cake. So go to that, that last slide now. The, the image that I had in my brain as I was growing up was that this is the plan, that, that we've got a small group of people that are going to hit celestial glory. And then we've got this massive terrestrial group, and then the celestial, that is the base of the triangle, that's the most. This is just how it was, how it was in my head. I don't know that it, it was ever taught that way, but what if... That triangle is upside down. What if a loving heavenly parent wants as many of his children as possible to be exalted? What if that triangle is upside down? We know from the scriptures that the celestial kingdom is populated with or will be populated with the worst of the worst. These are the vile people. These are the murderers and the adulterers, people who just refuse to accept Christ. And of the people that I know, that's not a very big population. So this was uh, an idea from my dad that what if Heavenly Father set us all up to succeed? 
What if somebody's path is just them trying to break out of the egg? What if it's just them trying to figure out how to fly, how to figure out how to take off and land on their own, and they're just going through this awkward, uncomfortable phase that to us looks like something scary because they've left a path that we're comfortable with, that we've um, maybe personally accepted ourselves. What if that experience is going to make them stronger? And we have evidence. We have scriptural evidence. We've got um, Saul, who became Paul. We have Alma the Younger. We have um, many, many examples of in the scriptures. We have ex examples in modern day of people who have taken a detour, and in many cases, they've come back. Um, there's the parable that says it doesn't matter <laughs> when you come back, you get the reward. So I just want to share my, uh, my um, experience with you, my testimony with you, that what if nothing's gone wrong? What if somebody or ourselves, as we take that detour, as we have our own personal struggles with a doctrine or with a policy or with the way the church has responded or not responded to something, what if, not, not, what if nothing's gone wrong? What if all that is supposed to happen because that's what makes us who we're supposed to become? What if those hard experiences give us the strength to become who our Father in Heaven needs us to be? Those are some of the thoughts that have blessed my life, that have helped me feel like it's okay. My Father in Heaven knows his children. He knows where they are. He'll do everything he can, I believe, within their agency, but he'll do everything he can to give them an opportunity to find and follow him. And that path may look different for me. It absolutely will look different for me than it does for you, than it does for Brennan, than it does for anybody else. And that doesn't mean it's wrong. It doesn't mean that anything's wrong. It just means we're trying to get there. And I share that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I love that, Ken. And I love that triangle setup. I remember being on my mission and there was a, I, without realizing that I had thought more like the left triangle, like there were just wasn't going to be very many people in the celestial kingdom. And most people were going to be in the terrest the celestial kingdom. And I remember a missionary pulling me and a few other missionaries aside and there. And he basically said th that reality was the other side of the triangle. He's like, you realize that heavenly father wants as many people in the triangle as possible. It's not, it's not that it's a, a not exclusive place. It's that his purpose is, is to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. And yeah. so he wants to help as many people succeed as possible. And that was, I don't know why, but that was such a, an eye opening experience for me because I'd gotten stuck in that idea that this was, you know, just this tiny group of people that were going to make it. But I, I agree with you. I think heavenly father will do whatever he possibly can I, as a loving heavenly father. I would hope that that's what he would do. That to do as whatever he possibly could to get as many people, as many of his children to the celestial king, kingdom. So I love that perspective. A, a lot of a lot of youth have done proxy baptisms, and a lot of times, be, especially before COVID, a member of the temple presidency would come in and and just chat with them. And so I happened to be sitting in one of these these um, group meetings, and the president came in, and he said he asked a question that I never heard before, and I loved it. And he said, with all these people that will be baptized for by proxy, how many of them are going to accept the gospel? And I thought, oh, I have no idea, but it's a great question. And he let that sit for a minute. And he said, most of them, most of them will accept the gospel. And what a beautiful idea that most of, I, I think that's, that's aligned with my father in heaven who loves me deeply and wants me to be exalted will do what he can to help me get there. I love that. That rings so true. <clears throat> that rings so true for me too. And I loved, I especially love um, your relationship with your son 
and that he is now teaching other people about Christ in his church. So I think so often, and, and maybe there is, I've never seen statistics for that, but I think so often as members of the church, um, the assumption that's made is when people leave the church, they leave all deity. And I certainly have most of the examples in my own personal life are that, that they don't, they don't go to another church that they're done with religion in general. And there's a lot of reasons why people speculate about that, but I think it's so important to consider the perspectives of that is not that that is there is not one way there is not one journey there is not one path um to come to Christ and i just loved man that's so special the way that he's able to use your book in his church to teach how to minister in his sunday school and it goes back to what i was talking about that i love that anthony sweat explains so well about the whole world being the kingdom and building yeah. the kingdom and just how cool is your son that that's how he chooses to spend his time. That's really special. It's fun. In fact, he's he's come home several times. Pastor Jody loves the chocolate cake, but he likes frosting. He likes he wants a lot of frosting. <laughs> and so I'll, if I have extra frosting, I'll okay, Brendan, this one's for Pastor Jody. And so he takes his Pastor Jody cake and that's awesome. Well, you and, know what I love to do? Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, you, you, go for it. Go for it. I was it. just going to say, I was thinking about, I was speaking at a conference once and there was a reverend from a church up in, in Holiday, Utah. She's a reverend up there. And we were talking afterwards and we had so much in common. What I really loved too was, was talking about some of the struggles I've seen within, we were talking about the struggles we've seen within our church culture and, and different things. And it was so interesting how similar they were. And it was a good reminder to me also as we have these kind of sensitive conversations uh, to recognize that a lot of the issues and the discrepancies we see, they're the same problems other churches have too. It's, it's not alone to Latter-day Saints um, to struggle with some of the ideas that we do and, and the contention that we do. And while we know it's not of Christ, it's there's some humanity, I think, in understanding that there is something to getting a lot of people together that believe the same thing and, and, and have so much meaning that they hold dear and just weird stuff happening sometimes <laughs> that's not of Christ. And that doesn't mean that his teachings aren't true. That was, that was powerful me, for me in connecting with perspective of a different religion. I love that. And, and to that point, Julie, and that I think there's a lot of reasons why people leave church, not just our church, any, but any church, there's a lot of reasons that people leave. Sometimes it's, it's doctrinal. Sometimes it's cultural. Sometimes they've been offended. Sometimes there's mental health situations that play a part as well. And that I, I remember talking with, um, I remember talking with a friend who had left the church and I said, I just asked, you know, are you, if you're willing to share what, was the reason that you left. And they looked at me and they said, you're the first person to actually ask me. Oh. And uh, that most, and, and I think that that's interesting, just where a lot of people just build up in their mind, oh, this is why they left, or they, they sinned their way out, or, you know, it's like, there's, there's a lot of reasons why people leave. And just to kind of wrap up everything that, both of you have, have shared to today that ultimately the best thing that we can do is we can love. And because we don't know what the reason is unless we ask. And even the reason that they tell us may not be the full reason. Mm -hmm. And regardless of what the reason is, Heavenly Father still loves them. And so we can love them too. And, and if in the future there's a place where they decide that they want to come back, then there's a loving place for them to return, which I think is... Uh, is so important. So thank you both for just the powerful messages that you shared tonight. This was absolutely amazing. And I've taken so many notes from everything that both of you have said, and it's given me a lot to chew on and think about as well. So thank you for what you've, what you've shared tonight. And to all of you who are watching at home, make sure you comment below and share your biggest insights from both Ken and Julie's thoughts tonight. There's been a lot of takeaways I know for myself at least. So make sure you share your favorite parts in the comments as well. With that, we'll finish with the closing prayer, and then we'll see you all next week for another Digital Fireside. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in, and we'll catch you next time. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this time we've had together to talk about your children, to talk about how to navigate our relationships as we as we consider our own membership and testimony in, in the Restored Church of Jesus Christ and, and how it impacts those 
around us in their relationships. We ask you to please bless each of us that we will have compassion in our hearts, that we will be given the words to say as we navigate these relationships, that we will, as we keep the Savior in mind as our ultimate example, that we will have those words and those feelings given to us. We are grateful for this gospel. We're grateful for the way it blesses our lives. We're grateful for our membership in the church and the covenants and the vehicle that this church is. We are most grateful for this kingdom we have here on earth to build and to to unify into one purpose and, and as we try to go closer to our Savior. We love you and we say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.